And we're right along through our study of Romans. As you know, we started in Romans chapter 1 in January this year. We will not finish the book of Romans this year. Uh, or next, somebody said. I don't know who said that, but it may be true. I don't know. Um, you've encouraged me not to be in a hurry. And I will tell you that uh, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, we probably literally could spend three weeks on that. We, I mean, we really could. There are so many high-impact terms, words used in just two verses that address um, um, a lifestyle that reflects a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So um, I'm not going to rush through Romans 12. I'm not really going to rush through verses 1 and 2. But today we're going to focus on verses 1 and 2. We're going to squeeze it for all we can. And, and uh, I've got a path and an idea of where I want us to go. But I want you to know that I actually do have a sermon on Romans 12, 1 and 2. And I preached it a few times. And I was very, very tempted to preach it today. But I've told you that I'm going to try my best to incorporate more questions in our lesson time. And I'm going to do that again today. But I do want you to know that this is a real high-impact passage of Scripture in my very own life. Okay, it means a lot to me. I remember um, sitting at the intersection of Jackson Avenue and uh, Stage Road. You know, anybody know where that is? Jackson Avenue, Stage Road. I was coming back from work at the French Riviera Health Spa where I worked out in Raleigh on Raleigh Millington Road. This was uh, many, many years ago prior to uh, Debbie and I being married. Uh, this is where we met out the French Riviera Spa there, though, uh, for the first time. And um, I remember sitting at that intersection there. Uh, it was about 1030 at night. I was a, I was a brand new Christian, probably mm, a year old, probably in the Lord. So that puts me into like 1980. And I'm sitting there, and the light is red. And man, everything in me is wanting to go around the corner to this little nightclub called uh, Stage Stop. And everything in me is just pulling me that way like a magnet. And I'm thinking, it's no big deal. You know, some of my friends are hanging out in there. And, you know, I, I'm not going to go in there and get drunk and carry on. But I may dance a little bit. Y'all didn't know I can dance. But I can't. I got some moves. Okay, I'll just tell you that right now. Okay. You know, I, I do. Uh, so I'm thinking, you know, I'm going to go in there and bust a move. And I'm going to go in there and just hang out with friends. And I'm not going to, you know, end up, you know, doing anything I shouldn't do. But I want to go in there. And, man, something else just told me, said, man, don't do it, man, don't do it, don't go. Pass it up, you know, don't do it. Go home. You need to go home. You need to go home. And, that's something, and, that's, and then something else is telling me, no, man, man, I mean, I'm, I'm wrestling with this steering wheel, you know, my car. I mean, I, I y'all never done that probably, so y'all just so holy and everything. And <laughs> y'all don't even know how to spell temptation, right? So I'm trying my best, man. I'm just, oh, man. I mean, I feel a literal civil war going on inside me, a spiritual civil war. And I just... Man, I just cried out to God, and I said, Lord, I can't do this anymore. I can't fight this. I can't resist this. I can't win this battle. What is wrong with me? I thought I was saved. And I don't know how many times the light cycled through while I'm sitting there, but I'm serious. I mean, there was nobody behind me. It was 1030 at night, and I know that the light changed at least once or twice. And I'm having this spiritual, I felt like Jacob, you know, wrestling with the angel uh, overnight. And man, I would just, I, and, and when as soon as I just, as soon as I stopped praying, the Lord just seemed to say back to my heart in a peaceful way, he said, Tony, I've just been waiting on this. I've been just waiting on this. You're not going to have success or victory uh, or whatever you want to call it in your Christian life trying to do it on your own. You're not going to be able to overcome this stuff, Tony. It's rooted deeply in your life. It's called sin. That temptation is always going to be there. Tony, you need me. You need the Holy Spirit. You need my Holy Spirit to reign and to rule supreme in your life. And you've got to do something. And here's the word. Here's the word that really, really hit me that drove me into Romans 12, 1 and 2. And when I read it, it really started ministering to me in a big way. And so if you're in here today and you're like, man, I'll keep falling into this. And I keep falling into that. And I'm on this spiritual roller coaster and I'm up and I'm down and I'm all around and I just can't seem to get it right. Listen, there's hope in Romans 12, 1 and 2 for you. Because the word that God laid on my heart sitting at that light that night was surrender. It was surrender. It was, it was yield. That light had turned you know, from red 
to green, Carl. And then, but you know, it goes to yellow in there, right? Caution, right? There's some caution in there, right? And, and, and there's some approach carefully. And so God was telling me, he said, Tony, you're saved. You're saved. You're mine. You've been born again. But you're doing the same thing you've always done all your life, whether it was in work or bodybuilding or through life or whatever it is. You're trying to just grit your teeth. You know what I'm saying? You're just kind of trying to grit your teeth and just get it right and live right and do right. And, and, and I knew I, I had already got to the point where I, I, could, I could be right, Eddie. I could be right because Jesus made me right when I got saved in September 1979. But a year later, I'm struggling with all this stuff in my life and all these roots that had to be pulled out. And the Lord said, Tony, I've been waiting. You need my Holy Spirit, and you need to surrender. You need to yield. You need to cry uncle, <laughs> if you will. You need to tap out, to use some days terminology. And all of a sudden, just a peace came over me, and do you know I turned left, and I went right on by that place? Went right on by. To my knowledge, I don't think I ever went back. I'm not saying I never went somewhere else or did something else, but I'm just saying I didn't go there. And God began to give me, as I yielded, as I surrendered, God began to give me that victory, if you want to call it victory, that joy, uh, that ability, okay? And, and I want to remind you of something as we get into Romans 12, 1 and 2. You know, Jesus told us something very, very important in the Bible, in the book of John. He said, when I leave, he said, it's going to be good for you. And, of course, the disciples were like, wait a minute, what, what do you what, leave? What do you mean leave? If you go, we're going with you. And he said, I'm going to leave. He said, it's going to be good for you because then I'm going to send my spirit, another one just like me, somebody just like me, and he's going to be with you and he'll be, in, be with you forever. And he called him something very interesting, the Holy Spirit of God. Jesus called the Holy Spirit of God, Bev, something very, very interesting. He said, he will be another, say it with me, helper. The fact that Jesus said, I will send you help, presupposes the truth that he knew we needed help. <laughs> okay. So as we look into Romans 12, 1 and 2, and as we dig into the practical applications of this, I want us to remember that word surrender. I want us to remember that word yield. We're going to look at what a living sacrifice is. What are, what are, sacrifices are usually what? If you think back to the Old Testament dispensation, right, and you look back, and, the, and even in the New Testament it was still practiced, right, Cindy? I mean, sacrifices were dead. They were dead, right? Okay? Um, so the Bible calls us in Romans 12, 1 and 2, it calls us to be what? Living sacrifices. So we want to talk about, you know, what that means, what that looks like. How do we flesh that out? How do we put that into what, you know, we call shoe leather? Uh, to this week and then however long the Lord uh, leads us. But I want you to know that the objective, if there's an objective and a stated objective of, of mine in Romans 12, 1 and 2, is that we would learn to live in spiritual victory. Now, are you with me? Okay. That we would be able to, Clayton, have, uh, to, that we'd be able to win some of these spiritual battles. Okay, right? Because that's really what the Christian life is all about. It's, it's sanctification. That's that process where we become, like Tammy said in her faith story, more and more like Jesus, okay? Um, we'll never be Jesus, okay? Let's get that straight. And we'll never reach the point of what we call sinless perfection, okay? You don't arrive until you arrive, okay? But we should be growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the Scripture says. We should be being transformed, that's another word we're going to look at here, into the image of Christ. And like Tammy said at work, you know, people should, wherever we go, whatever we do, not just church, people should see something that resembles the Lord Jesus in my life. Okay? And as you know, people struggle with a lot of stuff these days, right? I mean, they do. I don't care whether you're in the church, Leonard, or outside the church. People are struggling with, with it. a lot of stuff and a lot of besetting sin. I mean, just, just pay attention, right, all around you. And this is a, this is a sex-crazed world and culture. Would you agree with that? I mean, just we're obsessed with it, okay? This is a drug-addicted uh, world. This, we, have a, we have issues. People have problems, okay? So they ought to be able to look at the church and individual members of, and when I say church, I don't mean Faith Baptist Church. 
I mean, the, the universal, eternal, worldwide church of God, they ought to be able to see something about me, something about you that resembles Jesus. And that means that we will have victory over sin, but not be sinless. Yes, Eddie? You know, one of the things I'm thinking is you said they want to see Jesus. Most of the time, they don't recognize what they're seeing. They just want something, they see something different. Different. Amen. And they're like, what's with that guy? I, I want what he has. Yeah, first they look at us, they might think we're a little loony, right? I mean, really, they might. Right. So they don't this, they don't that, they don't the other. And people see Christianity what as a... Our, our, our differentness. A differentness, right. Yeah. That's right. Uh, there's a differentness. Yeah. We can look at that difference difference as a good or bad thing, but it's a difference, right? Okay. God has made us to be distinctive. Distinctive. That's exactly right. And, we're gonna, and that's another thing we're going to... You see the second word here? By the way, this is not my handwriting. It hasn't improved at all, okay? I'll just tell you that right now. Uh, Don's counterpart, Ms. Debbie, also wrote this, was nice enough to write this on the board for me, okay? So that, that's the separation part, and we're going we're gonna to look at that too, okay? So, so I just want you to know I want to set the table a little bit and, and let you know what the objective is and where I'm coming from and what my frame of reference is. And I will tell you that these two verses, the truth of these two, you know, how do many of you know the Bible's not just a magic wand? <laughs> You just don't wave it over whatever it is that you're dealing with and it just, you know, magically goes away. And somebody says, claim a verse, claim a verse. Well, what does that even mean? I can quote a verse. I can claim it. But here's the deal. Nothing happens until we act on it. Are you, are you with me, Jeff? Right? I mean, nothing happens until we act on it. Okay? God's given us the resource. He's given us the Holy Spirit. He's given us the Word of God. He's given us the body of Christ. But, but, we, but then we've got to act on that. We have to... We have to walk in that truth, okay, and in that light and in the Spirit. So let's read Romans chapter 12 and look at verse 1 and 2. And you know I'm going to stop right on the first word because the first word in the New American Standard in NIV is what? Wow, you guys, man, I tell you what, y'all stole my thunder, okay? Therefore, what is the therefore, therefore? I heard Dr. Jack May say one time, how many of you know Jack May? I heard Dr. Jack May say one time that uh, every time that, that therefore is a backup word, and, and it makes a lot of sense. If therefore puts you in reverse, Cindy, okay, because it's referring back to everything that's been said before. Because this is true, because that is true, uh, in light of this or that or the other. Therefore, it's in a saying now it's a corner word too. Because of all the things that the Apostle Paul has written about in Romans 1 through 11, because he says that in chapter 1 that men are all uh, guilty of sin and condemned and their hearts are hard and God lets it become harder. In fact, he even helps harden it if that's what they choose to do. That he's, God says, that's what you want? Okay, here's some more of it. And then there's the, the, the therefore of condemnation. Then there's the, the therefore of justification. It says, you know, therefore we're justified by grace, you know, by, uh, by faith through his grace. And then there is the, the therefore of the, uh, the Gentiles and the, and, the, and the Jews, both being uh, sinners but having the availability to the grace of God and God justifying us. And then there's the therefore of the future of Israel because he told us in chapters 10 and 11, actually 9, 10, and 11, that God has a plan and a future for Israel uh, and he hasn't forgotten about them. And so we said that means he hasn't forgotten about us. And so, so he said because all this is true and because... Because in verses 33 through 36, because God's wisdom and depth and knowledge and understanding and riches are unfathomable and because he's bestowed all of this grace and mercy and goodness on undeserving people, because of all that and in light of all that, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is a spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So that, here it is, so that you may prove what that will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. I love the way the King James reads in this. That's not what I'm reading from. It's not the Bible that somebody gave me that when I first got saved. So I didn't know they had a Bible that you could read and understand. They had notes and stuff, and I, I did not know that until somebody gave me a Ryrie Study Bible in uh, 1979, and it was a New American Standard. And I just thought that was, wow, that's a Bible like I've never read before. But the King James, of course, uh, is um, one of the most uh, trusted and uh, universally read and uh, sold Bibles. Does anybody here have a King James Version? 
Huh? Did, did, Michelle, you don't mind reading, do you? From because I know you, I don't usually call on people to read, but I think you're comfortable reading. Would you mind reading verses one and two from the King James, please, and kind of read it kind of loud? Time out. Time out. Okay. I know. I'm. I know. I'm sorry. Are we okay? Okay. <laughs> I beseech you. I beseech you. That's a. That's. We don't use that kind of word all the time, right? Though. So, but you read that, you still get the idea that it means I what? Strongly urge you, strongly, or I want to encourage you greatly. Okay, I beseech you. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Stop, time out. Stop a minute again. I'm, you know I'm going to do this, right? Okay. I don't ever do this, but I think me and you're okay with that. Although Stuart's got his arms crossed looking at me really hard right now. And Stuart's a pretty strong guy. Your Bible said, which is your reasonable service of worship. See, my Bible, the New American Standard says, which is your spiritual service of worship. And we're going to talk about worship again, too. And worship as a lifestyle, not just an event, okay? Worship is a lifestyle, not just an event. You get that? Worship is a lifestyle, not just an event, okay? So yours says reasonable. Now, get this, get this. That means it is logical. That means it is logical. It makes sense because of all that's been done and said before on your behalf. It makes sense that we present ourselves as that living sacrifice. Go ahead. Amen. Thank you so much for reading it. And thank you for letting me banter with you there a little bit, okay? So if you had to paraphrase these two verses, you, you, if you had to paraphrase these two verses and kind of just sum it up as what it means to you, okay, and what it means, how would you do that? Behave like a Christian. What? Behave like a Christian. Behave like a Christian. All right, that's good. How else? How would you paraphrase it? you got to also seek out what being a Christian is. Not, it's not going to just happen. I mean, you've got to be in the Word and, and pray. Right. And chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 um, assumes that you've been paying attention for the first 11 chapters, right? And you've known that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. And it, that, that, that um, God commended His love, Romans 5 says, God commended His love, that is, He demonstrated His love toward us, in that, watch this, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So God doesn't wait on you to clean up your act and then come to Him. He says, come to me and I'll clean up your act if you'll let me, right? Well, you Amen. You it up in what you said, your illustration at the beginning, and then you followed it up a few minutes later, you said it's the acting out. Mm of what we've learned and mm. the test that the Lord gave you when you were driving home that day, you ended up through His, the Holy Spirit acting out mm. exactly what this testing is talking about. Acting on that truth. Yeah, right. Okay, acting on Right. What I already knew, but I just like, how do I do this? Right? Okay. I think how we, we do this is we give our lives away. Okay. I, I think all day long we have the opportunities to speak truth into somebody else's life to, to try to leave them better than we find them. Mm. Uh, I think that the, our deal is to, to live out our faith. Mm. It, people are watching. Oh, yeah. People are watching. Oh, yeah. That's exactly they right. They might believe what you say, but they'll certainly believe what you do. Amen. That's right. Somebody else, how would we paraphrase these two verses? Go ahead, Dean. Computer in your mind has been programmed all your life. It's full of junk. <laughs> Have to reprogram your computer, and all the way you're going to do it is put your nose in the book. <laughs> Y'all hear that over there? Huh? Y'all hear that over there? Your, your mind's been programmed all your life, you know, to uh, believe certain things and act on certain things, and uh, you, or maybe what the things you've been told, you know what I mean? You're this, or you're not that, or whatever. So you have been all this program and all this input, you know, and um, if it's garbage in, it's garbage out. That's what we used to say, right? Guy go, whatever that is, you know, garbage in, garbage out. So you're saying keep your nose in the book. I get in the book, the book gets in me. Amen. Amen. Okay. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am, Miss Judy. I had a friend one time, and she was really good friend with the reason she lived through this. But I said something one day about I don't want to do something, and she said, well, Judy, he kind of make it across for you. Why can't you give it all up for him? 
Mm. Mm. And that's when it says, which is your reasonable service. Mm. After everything you said you did for us, how can you not get him on the job? And that's really exactly what the the transition here is. Somebody, a lot of people, and even theologians, have tried to unhitch uh, chapter 12 from the first 11 chapters. And that you can't do that. That's not the way this is. It's not like all this is theology and now all this is uh, behavior. It's not like that. All this is doctrine and now all this is duty and there's a line of demarcation. No, it's, it's because of. It's in light of. It's therefore. It's linked t together. Dave, did you put your hand up? No. To be Speak up. To be transformed, could that not mean to, be, to find our spiritual gifts? Spiritual gifts are addressed a little bit later on in Romans 12, the same inside chapter. So it may have something to do with it. There certainly is a connection as you, as, as you are transformed from the inside out. And we're going to talk about difference in conformity and transform, conforming and transforming. But yeah, as you're transformed from the inside out and you begin to see that God has put a rich royal deposit inside you called a spiritual gift, yeah, you'd want to use that to his glory. And that's part of that yielding and that surrendering uh, to what he has for your life and not necessarily what you think is always best. Okay, not that you check your brain at the door, but you still, there's something that supersedes your brain, and that's God's spirit. <laughs> okay, anybody else? Come on, Beverly. It's not a one and done. Renew your mind to have a mind like Christ. You got to do that all the time. Mm. And, um, mm. You got to stay in the Word. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Okay. All right. So listen, we, we must turn our learning into living. We must turn our learning into living. Our doctrine, okay, whatever doctrine we embrace or adhere to or, or believe in, whatever doctrine we embrace drives our duty. Okay? Belief informs our behavior. Belief informs our behavior. If I were to tell you, oh my gosh, the building is on fire, if you believe me, what would you do? You Right. You'd run over me when you send me. I mean, you just knock me down and keep on going, right? I mean, you just, I'd be burning up. You just leave me. Okay? If you believe that belief, if it's strong enough and you believe it and you embrace that, then you're going to act on that. So there's no difference in the spiritual life, okay? What we believe, and we can, we can say we believe anything we want to say we believe, but if we don't act on it, do we really believe it? We've got to be living. Living. Living sacrifice. Living sacrifice. Living sacrifice. So there are three commands here in these first two Verses. Three commands. There really are. And you may think there are more, see more, you may dig more out of it. But what three jump off the page commands do you see? Present. That's the one word. Present. Oh, wow. Look, Sam, that's on the board. Look, Sam, did you cheat? Oh, you put your glasses on so you can see this far? I got you. I got you. You look kind of smart in those glasses, too, by the way. Huh? Presentation. That's right. They're present. Present. You know, it's like when uh, at the when two people get married and you go to a wedding and they've gone through all the things that you do at a wedding and the the, the preacher uh, then uh, says uh, you may kiss your bride and they kiss and then he turns them around and faces the congregation, the audience, or whatever. What does he say? I now present to you. Blah 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 blah. David and Tammy Matlock, husband and wife, you know, blah, blah, blah. Pres what? Time out, man. <laughs> Time out. Time out. There are children in here. There are children in here. Our daughter is here. Exactly. She's used to it. <laughs> Which is a good thing. She's used to it. Tammy. No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. Hey, baby, you never get used to it, do you? <laughs> hey, it's just gross, isn't it? It's just gross. It's just nasty. It's just gross. Don, make sure you don't edit that out. 
If you want to get another good laugh, go to ChristianInspirationalRadio.com and pick up on what we're laying down. Amen? <laughs> That's great. You, it, by present to you, blah, 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 blah. And that is a whole new uh, arrangement, a whole new relationship. That, that's where the two have, you know, they become one, and that's the beginning of it. But there's a presentation of uh, those folks, and it's a, it's a once and for all, but it is, like Miss Beverly said, an ongoing, everyday thing. Amen? Okay? So there are three commands. Sam, you said presentation. There's a present your bodies a living sacrifice. What's another command? What? Can y'all hear her over there? Huh? No? Okay. Don't be conformed. Don't be conformed. So the first command that you see in there that jumps right up off the page is present your body. That's an action word, right? I mean, where's Lisa? Lisa, you're a school teacher. There are verbs, there are adjectives, there are nouns, right? You have all those things. And when there's a verb in the Bible, that means what? That means that something is required. We need to act on something, right? Okay? Or, or stop acting on something okay so there's a present your body as a living sacrifice and then do not be conformed to the world what's the other one be okay be not what conformed but be transformed okay we're going to talk about that in just a minute so when the bible says therefore i urge you brethren i, I encourage you strongly i it's almost it's like michelle's version king james says beseech you it's almost it's I almost get the sense of you know Paul's on he's pleading he's pleading he said man because of all this that God has done for you how could you and me do any less how could he not amen amen I mean he wasn't looking for Jesus <laughs> Jesus came and got him didn't he and opened his eyes and changed his life and his destiny forever and counted him worthy, as he said, you know, one untimely born, if you will, because he wasn't one of the 12 disciples, but one born later down the road, and now he is an apostle and a disciple and a eyewitness to the majesty of Christ. Are you want to say something else? Okay, your face says something different, but you didn't want to say something? Oh, okay, all right, okay, okay. So, so when the Bible says present your bodies, I now urge you by the mercies of God to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. Tell me how that works. Tell me how that works. I know how it worked in my life, and I know how it continues to work in my life, but tell me how that works for you or how you think it should work for you when you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. There's that presentation that we wrote on the board. Well, you mentioned earlier that, that a sacrifice involved death. Mm -hmm. So it's a death to self. And to our old ways before we can live out and flesh out what God's told us to do. The surrender. Yeah. Do we like this word? No. Huh? Who said no so quick? Me. You did, Chuck. Is surrender hard for you? It is. Huh? I'm selfish. I want what I want. Man, I didn't ask you to confess everything. I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> Brother, hold on. Brother, hold on. <laughs> Um, no, no, but that's real. I mean, that's surrender. We're taught in life, right? You know, uh, don't give up, don't give in, right? I mean, and there's some, there's some, uh, some places where that's appropriate, uh, and some things in life where that's appropriate. Don't give up and don't give in, you know, and hold out and hold up, and you know, don't wave the white flag, you know, don't keep fighting, don't surrender. So it's foreign to. It's, it goes back to what Dean said. We're programmed, right? But how many of you know surrender really is a sweet thing when you surrender to the right thing? Right. Yeah. Yes, ma'am, Michelle. There are three words in my notes here. Intelligent, rational, and deliberate decision. We have to get up on that altar. We have to step up there and lay ourselves down. So Whoa. and deliberate, and it's something... We thought it's irrational. It's not irrational. So, there's a word that I'm kind of gleaning from what you're saying. It, it, this, invo it, this involves our will, right? He said, I, I, I beseech you, brother, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you 
present your bodies, that's your whole, what, what does it mean when it says present your bodies? What, what is that, what is that, how does that connect or communicate to you, present your bodies? Is this just a, is, huh? Whole you, being. Right, everything, right? Your total, total being. If you, if you lay something on the altar and sacrificed it, I mean, that's everything, right? I mean, that's, that's mind, will, emotion, that's everything. How many of you know that at least half the time, we don't even know what our motives are? Huh? Nobody else? I mean, we think we know ourselves pretty good, you know, but we cut ourselves a break all the time. We all do, okay? And I told you before, we judge others by their actions. And we judge ourselves, our intentions. And we think that knowledge is the same thing as obedience. We think because we know what's right, we're doing what's right. And so we give ourselves a break, and we don't really surrender, and we don't really yield. We don't give our will, and we don't even know what our motives are sometimes for doing the things we do or not doing the things we don't do. So if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit of God turning on his spotlight and searchlight in our heart and lives, wouldn't it, we wouldn't even know what, you know what areas of our life we needed to address or to alter or change. So that presentation, that, that presentation, that, that not just initial, but as Beverly said, that ongoing daily and throughout the day, I might add, several times a day, we have to put ourselves back on that altar. And that's an act of our will. And our will is really hard to break. Okay, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. You can outwardly surrender to. You know, you're struggling with something, and you you know the right thing to do, the mm. knowledge thing, and you outwardly surrender. And then it's not it's not like what it should have been or mm. what you thought it would be, because inwardly mm. you really haven't surrendered. Mm. Yeah. You know, it's all about your attitude, <laughs> kind of thing. Right. I mean, I've been in places. I'm like, okay, I did it. I did it. I did it. Why is it not doing what it's supposed to do? It's because your heart wasn't right. Nothing inside, heart, motive, nothing was right. It's, I was it's, outwardly doing what it looks like I was supposed to do. I needed to be doing. The illustration for that in, in, in my memory pops up where a little boy was five years old and his mother told him, said, if you do that again, I'm going to make you go over and sit in the corner. And he did it again. And she said, you go over there now and you sit in that corner. And he got in the chair and he sat in the corner and was facing the corner. And she said, maybe that'll teach you a lesson. He looked over his shoulder. He said, I'm standing up on the inside. Absolutely. And says, I, I, I'm standing up on the inside. And that's kind of what we do sometimes, right? We say, okay, I'm going to do what's required. <laughs> I'm going to do the minimum. I'm going to do enough to get by, but not, no more. Okay, no more. I'm not going to have, my heart's not going to be in it. When you put yourself on the altar, when I put myself on the altar, when we put ourselves on the altar, somebody said it a while ago, we have to put ourselves up on there. That's why, why, why do you think that, it's, that Paul in the, and God didn't tell us in here, I command you, brethren, I command you, brethren, by the mercies of God. He could have said that. He could have said that. He could have said, I command you to uh, present your bodies a living and a spiritual. Why do you think he didn't say, I command you? Because it's going to be a spiritual thing. It's between them and the Lord, not them and Paul. <laughs> them and who? Paul. Paul. Right. Okay. All right. Well, Jeff, did you, you raise your hand? You're talking about the sweetness of surrender. And you know, you take this, this is all a progressive thing. It just don't happen like that with one act. Come on. And so when we get that sweetness and we really get to to feel that goodness of God when we are obedient and we do sacrifice ourselves or whatever it is in front of us, you know, the transformation takes place, but, you know, God wants us to keep doing that because when we do it a time or two, it progresses into more times because we're, we're, we're grasping that sweetness to the then we can really know His will. He, that's what He wants us to see. Amen. The product of it is, I mean, He just lavishes. I don't know if you know this or not, but God really wants us to live in our sweet spot. Yeah, yeah. And I don't golf, but I know what the sweet spot is on the club. Okay, That's when you hit that ball just right, and the angle of the club head is just right, and the swing is just right. It makes a nice, good, solid you know, sound, boop, you know, however it is, you know, sound something like that. 
or if you're playing baseball and you hit it right on the right, the fat of the bat and that kind of thing, and the body makes a connection. God wants us to live in our sweet spot, and that's what we're going to get to in Romans 12 as we move through the spiritual gifted areas and all that. He wants us to live in the sweet He has a sweet spot for us, and, and, and it's on the altar, and it's staying on the altar, and, we, and then we'll learn what that good and acceptable and perfect will of God is. I could have started this off by saying, how many of you would like to know God's perfect will for your life? Everybody's hand in here would have gone up, and then you said, Tony, how are you going to tell 50-something people in here what God's perfect will is for their life? Well, I'm not going to tell you that. But God will tell you that as you apply the truth of these uh, the, and the principles in his word, God will show you that. I told somebody one time, the will of God isn't necessarily something that you go find. It's something that finds you. You hear me? Listen now. This, listen. This is what coming for right here this morning. Okay? The will of God isn't necessarily something you go find. It's something that finds you as you walk in his truth and his light. Okay? So... Keep that in mind. God has a sweet spot for every one of us. Some of us are operating outside that sweet spot. Some of us are walking in disobedience. Some of us, you know, we try to call the shots ourselves. We don't want to get on the altar. We don't want to surrender. Well, let me ask you a question. How's that working out for you? How's that work out for you? We all know people who, that ain't working out so good. Come on, Dean. Tony, the, the, everything that's been said in here this morning all needs to be remembered. I mean, we, we really need to play this one back. We're coming back no, to it. I mean, in our minds and go the yes. thing and all that. Yes, got you. He did not command it because it's a love relationship. Bam, I was hoping somebody came up with that. You can't command love. Thank you. That's why he says, I urge you on, please, please. That's God speaking. Can you hear a father's heart? Oh, yeah. Can you hear a father's heart in that? But now that's not all of it. There's two things that are going on here that, that, that don't fit. Sacrifices. <laughs> They're dead. They're also bound. That's right. You cut the throat of that lamb. It's bleeding out. You put him on that altar and they had hooks and things. They mm -hmm. That's out. right. That's right. It's a, it's a nasty thing, guys. Right. But what kind of sacrifice is it? Living. Living. It's every day. It's not every day. It's all during the day. That's right. <laughs> and he'll come to you. Sometimes it's that great big thing. And sometimes it's just that mm -hmm. little thing. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, dear. Mm. I mean, that kind of... <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, wait a minute. Hold on. Time out. <laughs> Boy, thank the Lord my wife is not in the room anymore. She went She went down to teach third year. I don't need her hearing that kind of stuff, okay? Wow. I urge you, therefore, brother. <laughs> Stop it. Stop it. But you know what, though? Let's get real just a minute, though. That's where the rubber meets the road, isn't it? That's where the rubber meets the road, isn't it? I mean, it really is. I mean, God's asking us to love. Come on, Darren. I'm glad Dean said that because I was sitting here and I almost said it. That word on the end, W-I-L-L, -L, the will. You said, why did God command me to do this? Mm -hmm. He wanted me to be able to choose. Mm -hmm. And that freedom that I have to choose is my will to do that. Mm -hmm. Because if he told Aaron. You must do this, thus, and that. Or if I told my wife, you must do this, thus, and that. If I told her to do that, and she's doing it because I told her, but if she's not doing it because she wanted to do it, it's a sad thing. But if she's doing it because she wanted to do it, that's the will that God is seeking from us. And when you say it, when we surrender, a lot of people don't see that the way you said it. You said it's a sweet thing. It really is. When you can surrender to something that has control of you. And Takes you the pressure off. I, 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 no, I don't have to perform anymore. I don't have to perform anymore. I can rest in His grace. I can rest in His will. I can rest in His love. And I can walk in truth. But I can't do it. On my own. I can't do it. He doesn't want me to. And he doesn't expect me to do it on my own. I just need to surrender. Just, need to yield. Come on. No, come on. about what we're talking about today, the world and Christian people walk around with this mindset that I have to be perfect. We're not perfect. And when you got to that life, you told God that you could not do it. Let's be honest about it. Heck, I'm in that same boat. I've been in that boat. Mm. Do I do it? Do I go there? Because when I change from being a worldly person to being a Christian, guess what? My worldly stuff hadn't left me. It's still in me. You're still 
in the world and not of the world. And that's why Jesus prayed, Father, I pray that you keep them from the world or, or out of the world. And that doesn't mean to take us out of it. Uh, that, and that's going to leave us, lead us to the uh, conformity uh, aspect of this. But I, time is out, guys, okay? I told you I was going to ask a lot of questions. I did. You were nice enough to make some contributions, very, very good contributions and uh, very meaningful, uh, very practical. And that's what I think that we need to do in the Word of God is say, how does this um, result in what changes, what modifications, what adjustments uh, do I need to make in my life? So. We're going to talk about a presentation, a, a separation, and a transformation. The, I wish I could leave this up here. Debbie, I don't, Debbie had to leave. I may get her, have to write, her, write that on the board again next week. You see the photos up here. Don was nice enough to catch me something. I wrote up here, a little bit corny, but bullfrogs, butterflies, and believers. What do they have in common? Ma'am? There was a metamorphosis that took place, right? I watched the video this week of how a caterpillar becomes a butterfly. I watched it. Y'all th think I'm crazy, right? Okay, well, you might be right. I don't know. But I told you I am a nut, but I'm screwed onto a good boat, and his name is Jesus. Amen? Okay? So, so, so you look at the butterfly, and you look at that thing, goes into that chrysalis and all that. I don't know if y'all knew this or not, but that, 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 that caterpillar actually decomposes completely in there. Its body turns on itself, and it disintegrates itself, and it just becomes kind of a gooey, stuff and then the cellular and molecular makeup of that caterpillar actually then begins to transform it from the inside out and it becomes a whole brand new thing where it doesn't have to even crawl around on the ground anymore and eat the leaves the thing grows wings and grows antenna and got this big long thing that comes out of his mouth and sucks out nectar out of the pot. it's a totally different thing it can soar to new heights a bullfrog starts how does that start out start a little old tadpole in the water you ever seen those little tadpole it can't come up on the land it can't live on the land. It lives in the water. And then over time, and the way God made it, it changes from the inside out. It starts growing a little tail on it. And then the eyes get developed. And then the feet get developed. And then it walks up on the land. And then it becomes a frog. And it starts jumping and bumping and thumping along on the ground. Okay? But it, and it don't live in the water anymore. It went through a major transformation. It's a metamorphosis. It's the same thing that Jesus went through on the Mount of what we call transfiguration when it says His Shekinah glory and majesty came out. And they saw Him and His clothes was white. And He, he looked like the sun. And his inner Shekinah glory came out of him. And that's what's supposed to be coming out of a believer every day is the glory of God and the Spirit of Christ so that people can see him in us. But it doesn't happen until we act on the truth of the Word of God and we're saved and we present ourselves every day as a living sacrifice. Because see, in that scenario too, the caterpillar had to die. In a manner of speaking, the tadpole had to die. In order for me to have victory, success, whatever you want to call it, over sin and over myself and over my own will, in order for me to be a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, knowing what his will and purpose is for my life, I have to also be changed from the what? Inside out. And that's the difference in watch this, being conformed and being transformed. Don't miss next week. Okay? It's not that I'm all so good and all that stuff, but the truth of the Word of God is necessary and needful, and we need to understand practically how to apply it. So living sacrifice. I'm looking at all you guys, and you're all living sacrifices. Let's put ourselves on the altar. Okay, Let's die daily to self. That's what Paul said. I die daily. Okay, Let's surrender to Him and His will, obey His Word, and let's make a presentation or a dedication of all that we are, all that we do every day to Him. Let's live our life as a living sacrifice. And remember, worship is not an event. It's a lifestyle. Father, thank you for your truth. Um, there's a whole lot, Lord, you know that I didn't cover today, but these folks have been very, very good and very smart and very spiritually minded and practical, and I appreciate that and respect that. And Lord, I learn something every week I come in here too, and I thank you for that. Help us, Lord, this week to understand what it means every day, all day, throughout the day, to live a lifestyle of worship as a living sacrifice so that we may prove that good and acceptable and perfect will of God is. Help us, Lord, to um, willfully surrender. Now that, those are, that's an oxymoron almost right there to me, Lord, your will and surrender, because our will almost indicates, you know, not thy will, but my will be done. 
And Lord, help us to be more like you when you said, and nevertheless, thy will be done. Help me, Lord, this week. I, I got some stuff going on in my life, Lord, that's pretty deep. And I know many other people do in here too. And, and I want to jump up and take control and run with it. And Lord, help me to um, lay it on the altar, lay myself on the altar, and let you work through me and in me for your good purposes and for your good will. And I pray, Father, we'll just get comfortable, more comfortable with that word surrender as we present ourselves to you. And next week as we look at what it means not to conform and then how to be transformed. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you all for your input.